BWI is live. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Welcome to the show. We've got a wide range of topics to talk about today on the BWI Live show. We'll be taking you through Penn State basketball, their big game tonight, previewing that with our experts, Nate Bauer and uh, Dave Eckert, who are covering the game. We'll also be talking about Penn State football, what's coming up with spring practice, the end of winter conditioning, all of those things here on the BWI Live show, plus your questions. If you want to get your questions on the show, make sure you drop them in the chat here and uh, we'll get to those at a certain point in the show. And of course, Super Chats are always uh, greatly appreciated. If you want to donate to the channel, we'll make sure to get your comment or your question up on the show. So getting to it today, let's introduce our panel. As always, Senior Editor for Blue White Illustrated, Nate Bauer. Nate, good afternoon. Happy Monday. How are you today? Uh, you know, scrambling. It's Monday, but here we are. Certainly is. Certainly is. And of course, never scrambling, always poised, and always ready to open the refrigerator and get something delicious. It's Dave Eckert. <laughs> Dave, good afternoon. How you doing, T. Frank? I'm doing all right. Let's get into the show. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, interesting comments um, the, on Monday when we get into some of the topics for Penn State football when it comes to spring practice and all of those things. Uh, but just want to get your general thoughts from a Penn State basketball perspective. We're going to be getting to that later in the show. But Dave, you wrote over at bluewhiteillustrated.com a preview of tonight's game. Can you give us a quick thumbnail scout of what's going on tonight and where fans can watch the game? So yeah, uh, Penn State has won its last two, uh, its last two games beating uh, Michigan State and Minnesota. They're going to Maryland, who is kind of a disaster right now um they've got an interim head coach they fired mark turgeon mid-season they're four and 11 in conference play um so they have a time they have a chance to win three in a row for the first time this season um and just generally they've got three pretty winnable games coming up um so you know not totally out of the question to say that they could be 500 in the big 10 by this time next week so uh big big stretch for them coming up for sure uh, Nate, what are you thinking about to start the week as we get into things, the swing of things for Penn State sports? What's on your mind? Yeah, this basketball game for sure. It's, uh, you know, look like uh, I get it. Uh, football reigns supreme always. But, um, you know, this is kind of an interesting stretch for Penn State basketball and Micah Shrewsbury's first season. Uh, I would disagree slightly with Dave's characteristic of of calling maryland a disaster like they they have lost a lot of games but in a lot of ways they're a similar team to penn state um if you if you go back and kind of look at some of their big 10 losses they're by a point a couple of points they have some blowouts too for sure but if you're if you're looking at like this game as a probable win for penn state uh i don't know yeah. that i would go you know what I mean? Like, I don't know that I would go. Um, not that you said that, Dave. You didn't say that, but I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> I think it like this is a this is a big one for Penn State because if they win, then the two after it at home are pretty manageable games. Like they they would really have an opportunity to put themselves in a in a solid position for postseason play. But uh, dare I call this must win? I, I think it's pretty much there like this is a must-win game for Penn State basketball um, and then we'll go from there we'll see what happens we'll get to a full preview of the game coming up in just a little bit but now that I have my notes up we can begin the show final week of winter workouts maybe um, it's a bit of a scramble before the show so I appreciate everyone uh, sticking with us as we get through the intro uh, I have some news on that T Frank yes what's that I can well no I could fill us in I, I oh have a, oh yeah I have, yeah, yeah. Like I figured out, and when I say figured out, I mean I asked someone who knows what the actual schedule is, and Great. it looks like um, so. Spring practice is set to begin on March twenty first, uh, and so there. It, but between now and March twenty first, there is a week of spring break that is set for March five until the 
13th or 12th or, you know, whatever it is that Saturday to Saturday. Um, and apparently it looks like Penn state will have it's like kind of max out. They always do a run up basically to spring break. And rather than having the max out on the backside of spring break, they're going to do it on the front side of spring break, then have spring break. So like March two, three, four, have have their testing for for spring practices or excuse me for winter workouts have a week of spring break have a week before spring practice and then spring practice begins so this is the second to last week when it comes to winter lifting they'll be doing all of their max testing next week which is not a, a nothing thing we've gotten some really interesting insights from Dwight Galt in the past but now new strength coach Chuck Losey is going to be taking the helm Dave do you know what to expect? What do you expect from, uh, I guess, what we learn coming up next week? Yeah, I mean, I think Chuck Losey is, I mean, he's a Dwight Galt disciple, right? So I, I'm I'm sure that he will have his own spin on things and that it won't be completely the same. But I also think if you're Penn State and you're replacing Dwight Galt and, you know, hiring his disciple is kind of a signal that you would like things to be as similar as they, as possible to what they were before. Um, so yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking forward to seeing who tests. Well, um, I know there's a couple guys that we've highlighted on here before that, you know, we really feel like need to make some jumps, but as far as the structure and, and what Penn state's been doing, I would be, I guess, pretty surprised if it's not pretty similar to what it's been previously. Nate, what sticks out to you? Something you've learned from these conversations during winter workouts? Yeah. So, so two things, um, something that sticks out, you know, there, there's always like Dwight Galt was always very forthcoming. And I guess that's what my mm -hmm. second thing is, is Galt always said too much. Like, <laughs> he, he always, <laughs> yeah, he, he was great said, for information. He was fantastic. He was so forthcoming. He was very honest and open. And it was just, it was always for fans. And I think the media alike, a great window in a time of year when, you know, there's just not a lot to, to judge on. And so when he's talking about guys who are, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three, in terms of how athletic they are, where they are in their careers, um, you know, just, just, kind of how freakish some of these guys are. It's always very, it's always very um, educating, right? I yeah. mean, it's, it, it, it always helps out uh, trying to get a gauge on who are some of the people that, you know, look, we all know who we're watching for next year. Like, I, I don't think there's any question about that. We, we know the, the, the major names and the major faces, but sometimes there are players who, I'm not going to say they fall between the cracks, but like you, you might not expect as much from them. And then you get an insight like Dwight Galtz that really clarifies for you and, and gives you a better idea that, yeah, they're making progress. There's somebody that you're going to want to keep an eye on through spring practice and through all of the off season, June, July, August, and going into the season. So the major question that I have and that I think is going to be supremely interesting is, you know, uh, not not to say that Dwight Galt was ever like insubordinate of James Franklin. Right. He right? was like, grandfathered in as the guy who kind of could say what he wanted. Right. It, like if he if he said more than James Franklin would have preferred that, you know, maybe it's a conversation, but there's probably not a lot behind that. Like it's still Dwight Galt. He is who he is and he's going to yeah. do what he's going to do how Chuck handles that, you know, might be a little bit different. It yeah. Might be a, a, a new spin on things for Penn state football. We'll see that, that for sure is what I was thinking as well, because I relate to Dwight Galt in his enthusiasm, right? He was always 
super excited to talk to you about what he is good at and what he's smart with and his passion for strength and conditioning. So you're right. He would go he would go into detail on things and he would talk to you about velocity based training and he'd give you ideas of what the you know the program looks like and kind of some details. Chuck Losey, I don't know if it's just the mustache, but he just seems like much more of a reserved man who is not going to be so forthcoming <laughs> with as much information. But this is a really I, I am I'm always fascinated by sports science as well. So I'm always interested to see players development and and kind of the the thought process behind it not just who got bigger but what's the what's the output from that and and what's the you know this is usually the time from what i've seen is this is where players are their heaviest after hypertrophy training which is where you can pack on muscle that's why this particular time is a very important time in the cycle who knows we'll see uh, so when it comes to that, we got a, we got another week before we get into any of those things and we find any of those answers out. But this past weekend, we got a glimpse at some of the new Penn State football players that are the early enrollees because of Thon. And Dave, I need you to break down everything you saw and heard from uh, Penn State football's freshmen during Thon weekend. Detailed report, okay. please. Yeah, sure. Nick Singleton, Drew Alar, Caden Saunders... Zane Durant, very good at cornhole. Like, I'm talking <laughs> elite levels of cornhole ability. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we saw Drew Alar throwing a mini football around. Uh, okay. Throwing it to Caden Saunders, you know, forming that partnership. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. It was fun. It was nice to see nice to see them hanging around, hanging around with the Thon families. Um, it's always a fun event to be at, just kind of observe because – um, you know, you get to see the players amongst themselves and amongst the Thon families just having a good time, um, playing some four square, um, trying to think what else was there. I think that's probably about it. Playing some soccer, Malik Mega, who I know played soccer growing up, looked like he was pretty good with, pretty mm -hmm. good with his feet. Um, so yeah, you know, it was fun. Uh, it's really my only takeaway of it. I don't have Dave. any actual insight, but Dave, this is. <laughs> This is where you're supposed to say that Drew Alar and Nick Singleton are ridiculously big and impressive physically. Yeah. And we're all wearing like sweatshirts, man. I, like, you, you know, like, <laughs> like <laughs> I really left you. I, I, in the rundown, I just said a little behind the scenes, Dave, give us your best stuff. I really left you to, to dry on this one. Like just out in the wind. <laughs> Drew Alar and Singleton all. is an all American. Say it, Dave. <laughs> He's an all-American cornhole player, but you know. <laughs> as I as I said uh, to a couple people today, this is this is a little bit of uh, we're getting blood from a stone here. Uh, so we're doing <laughs> this is this has got to be the slowest time of year for Penn State football, which is why we're taking a look at 2022 quite a bit today, and we're going to dive into something that's a little more off the field, as far off the field as you can get when it comes to Big Ten media rights and some of the large numbers that are being thrown around for what's going on on the television side for Penn State football. So, Nate, I'm going to go to you with this one. Uh, the Sports Business Journal has been reporting that we could see our first billion-dollar media deal on the college football level for the Big Ten television rights. What does that do for the Big Ten and their standing in the Power Five conferences. What uh, what does it do for it? I'm not sure that it does a lot because I think that the Big Ten already is that, right? I mean, it's uh, you saw some of the reporting over the weekend, really in the conversation about the playoff being shut down, right? I mean, I think that happened on Friday. But the you know the playoff expansion didn't happen. We know that the ACC stood in the way of that. Um, but the reporting that came out of it was look like the SEC and the Big Ten kind of run things. Like yeah, they, they are the show. And so it, it, is it a further demonstration of that dominance? Yeah, I, I think definitely. I mean, I, I think the the bigger question and the bigger the bigger takeaway from a potential billion dollar deal is it's things are being 
bought money is being spent all over the place right that might not necessarily exist right now but will in the future and so it's what, what do you mean the, by that the, well i just think that there's a little bit of a, a an element of spending the raise before you have it gotcha that's, that's kind of happening in college athletics as a whole um you know if you if you look and you don't need to like go into the crazy detailed numbers to to understand that for every Big Ten school, for every athletic department that operated athletic programs during the pandemic, when there was also no revenue coming in from a gate perspective, right? Like there were no fans. Like everybody got bludgeoned, everybody. And so, uh, you know, and so there's this this um kind of concurrent wavelength happening of feeling like you need to continue to make improvements as a program i mean i think that certainly with james franklin that's a relevant conversation all the time of hey this is stuff that needs to happen this is the way it needs to be done and often there is a dollar sign attached to those initiatives right <laughs> and so there's there's that train but then there's also this train of hey uh, uh they they need like income right because the the tv deals still happened there was still like they were st all of these big 10 st schools were still making bowl revenue and uh tv revenue that was split amongst them all of that's fine and well but when you lose seven home games for a season and all of the money that that accompanies it like that's a big dent to the budget so i i do like when you're talking about a, a, a one billion dollar tv rights deal or media rights deal like that's two and a half times what the current deal is yes yeah. yep that's going to be that's going to be very very significant to the bottom lines of a lot a lot a lot of these big 10 institutions what does that do to I don't want to say even even the playing field with the SEC because the SEC, their media light rights are locked in currently. So they're not going to be renegotiating anytime in the future to match that number, but they did acquire Texas and Oklahoma. So is this the kind of chess match, Dave, going on behind the scenes of trying to, as much as we look at, I, I think, as a, as a Penn State channel, as a Penn State-centric audience, we tend to look at the SEC as the bad guy in this story of the professionalizing of sports, the consolidation of power, the competition, right? Is the is the Big Ten doing the same thing? Like, is this just one chess move after the other to try and stay on top of the hill between two teams and not necessarily the SEC driving everything? I think the Big Ten and, you know, some of the other conferences in the alliance, I guess, the ACC and the Pac-12 is trying to approximate what the sec is doing as closely as it can without making the same academic concessions as the sec makes regularly like those three conferences are like very much still here to play school you know if we're going to borrow from i think it was cardale jones who said that that is correct. uh but um you know so i i, I think that it is an arms race you're right in describing it like that it it, it is a chess match but they're playing it differently <laughs> because they value different things, right? I mean, the big 10 schools and, and a lot of the schools that they've aligned themselves with now, you know, I mean, a lot of them have a ton of sports, you know, how many does Penn state have 30 something 32? Um, you know, a lot of SEC, SEC schools have 15 um, and, and, and the big 10 values that um, and, and Penn state through everything that they say publicly values that also. So I think that they're, trying to keep up um without making concessions as, as best as they can and we'll see we'll see if it works I, I i don't know the answer to that question but i think they're playing the same game with uh with, with different hands of cards is how i would describe it I, that's that's a fair point i was thinking about a lot of this stuff uh but first before we get to that if you have any questions make sure you drop them in the chat we'll be getting to fan questions we got a couple good ones in there from bradley david i'm just throw this up here right now because david is always ready to go on a monday he's doing a much better <laughs> job than i am today all caps with 
five exclamation points. Woo! 2022 Big Ten champions, Penn State Dave. I don't know if he's Penn State Dave or if Dave Eckert is Penn State Dave or if we're talking about basketball champions or football champions, but Penn State's going to be a champion of something in 2022, according to Dave. So that energy out the gate today from Dave. We've got Bradley in the chat as well and Jonathan. So if you've got any questions, we're going to be taking those in just a little bit as we get through you know, some of these um, economic I don't want to say it's – there's a lot of stuff that goes into this because it's not just about the economics. It's about the politics of it. Uh, Dave, the way you said that, I was thinking about all these things as I'm reading up on why the college football playoff didn't expand, why you're getting a billion-dollar deal for one organization over the other, and the most comparable thing is clearly the NFL. The NFL does – not negotiate independently between teams, as we all know. 32 franchises, individual organizations that are under the same umbrella. College football is very much a, if I'm going to use an economic word, a capitalist system where these individual conferences are loosely agreeing to compete against each other, but they are entirely separate with entirely different agendas trying to all reach the same outcome. So this is going to be very interesting to watch which model works going forward. And that's why, because they all have their own interests and they all have their own um, angles and power structures. And even within each individual conference, there are 12 to 14, or if you're the big 12, nine different <laughs> or seven or five or whatever it is now. Um, there are each has their own ind ind individual agendas as well. So, that's why, to me, like the, the League of Extraordinary Pinky Promises, the Alliance, I just I don't see a way that that is going to continue to work because you have one link between the Pac-12 and the Big Ten outside of the, the ac academics, and it's the Rose Bowl, that that is a very important thing to them from a, from a TV standpoint, from a tradition standpoint. Nate, when it comes to the college football playoff expansion, were you surprised that we remained at four, and are you disappointed we remained at four? with that particular conversation. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm disappointed. I think that, um, for the game it's, it's necessary. I've, I've talked about this before, but my cliff's notes version is that, I mean, just to go back to something that you just said, it's not going to be interesting to see what happens moving forward. The game is already over the sec won. <laughs> the sec has something like 17 out of the last 20 national champions. Like the, the game is over. The game That's has a fair been point. Over. That's a fair and point. So, uh, the SEC model is the one that wins national championships, and the Big Ten and the ACC, like good for Clemson, uh, as the outlier, but their model uh, doesn't. And so, that's that. Like, uh, you know, good for. Uh, some of the other non-rev sports, maybe that have a better chance at winning national championships and competing in the NCAA. I mean, I, I would be interested to see how that breaks down uh, in terms of SEC conference wins in the other non-rev sports, given the fact that they, like Dave said, most of them don't have them. They, they just like, does Alabama have a wrestling program? I, I don't know. <laughs> hey. They have a yeah. golf program, but uh, <laughs> point being is right. guess what they want to win. Football, football and basketball men's basketball that's it yep that's what they are here for that's what they're playing um so no so there's that element and then for the playoff like i, I just i don't see it, it again I'm, I'm stealing from someone and i don't know who at this point college football and college basketball are talent acquisition businesses mm -hmm. that's it you got to get the best players to come play for you. Well, if the teams and the programs and the franchises that you're competing against are the ones that always win the championship and it's open season for the, as many of those best players to join that program as they want, guess where they're going to go? Like right. they're just going to keep going to so, those schools. So then – is it wise that the Alliance voted against playoff expansion? No, because that, that's 
That's how it worked out, according to Heather Dinich of ESPN, is that those three conferences all voted against playoff expansion for a, a number of reasons, but when it comes down to it, the money side of things, there was no clear determination on that, and that's your ticket in. You know, the, the random occurrence, the random chance that comes from a playoff expansion of you catch somebody on a bad day and all of a sudden we have more people in the club, so you may have an opportunity. Dave, is I don't want to say, like, it, it was it a good idea, but, like, is it worth it to vote against the ultimate prize of getting your team to the national championship, which creates this environment of this perpetual success machine over not knowing what happens in one year of revenue in like whatever was year 13 of the deal. No, I mean, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, it, 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 I, I was very confused to be totally honest because it, it would seem like playoff expansion benefits the, the 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 conferences that vetoed it more than it benefits the conferences that that wanted it. So I don't know. It's it's very confusing. Um, you know, I was thinking about it actually, and and it, it we have a model for this um, already for for what's happening in college football right now. It's in Europe. It's in soccer. Um, you know, there's there's varying levels of financial might among the European soccer leagues. Okay, and they all come together to play in a, in, in continental European competitions and the English teams, because they always have the most money typically dominate, but occasionally they don't. Um, so that's what you're looking for. If you're Penn state, you're looking for that one year where the sec doesn't dominate. That to me is best case scenario. So, you know, if you're looking for Penn state to be Alabama, like, sorry, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I, I think you're looking for that one or two seasons of variance and you get more variance by creating a playoff format rather than a very exclusive club of four, four programs that is likely to include two SEC teams. So I just, it, I was very confused. I don't really get it. Um, does the money and and that's why i wanted to circle back to this i want to start with the big 10 media rights does that backstop some of that decision making of okay so we're not going to get a national championship we're going to get ohio state to the playoff every once in a while we're going to get michigan in there but we're going to financially dominate and that's really what we care about in the end is the financial dominance like yeah we want to win but really what we want to do is we want to have the most money so that we can have as as nate has talked about the most you know uh, institutional prestige of having 31 sports at Penn State. Is, is that but, a fair way to look at that? But I don't I don't think there's a scenario in which they they do have the most money because even even if they compete with the SEC for a little while with this new with this new deal, I mean the SEC, as we pointed out previously, just added Oklahoma and Texas. Right. So whenever they renegotiate or, or whatever, I mean, obviously that's going to be a bigger deal than what the big 10 does. So I don't know. I, it, I don't, I don't, I guess I just don't understand that view of it because I don't, I don't think that outcome is realistic, but. I think, I think that, I think that the thing to keep in mind that differentiates the big 10, and this is why, you know, we go back to, Jim Delaney being three steps ahead of everybody was, Oh, like Rutgers stinks. Why would you add Rutgers? Right. Maryland stinks. Why would you add Maryland? Well, the answer is because now the big 10 has guaranteed cable package money from all of the biggest cities in this country outside of Los Angeles. Yep. Yep. And, and so, you know, that, that is just a, a huge piece of this is that the SEC, like, yeah, the SEC is going to be competitive because it's a product that people want to watch, but I don't know that it's actually as broad or contains as many people in that swath of the country yeah, as remain in, you know, basically the Northeast corridor. So you, and you mentioned, you, you mentioned that the, for winning the model, 
is the SEC model. And there's no there's no comparison. For football. For football. When it comes to this particular conversation, are we having two different conversations about money versus winning? Because we're t- I, I'm tying money into winning. Is that the case, Nate? I, you know, look, like I, I, I think that money has a lot to do with winning, but there's a lot of other things outside of money that also have to do with winning. Uh, demographic shifts in the United States in terms of where people are moving, where the talent is in football, and obviously, as I'm going to keep hammering because it's the most brilliant thing in the world that on three did and has done is the proximity from home yeah. of the recruiting profiles. Like it adds up <laughs> more often than not, people are going to stay closer to home. And so when all of the best players grow up in the South and end up going to school or to a university in the South, like that's, that's just what it is. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a much harder pool to get somebody from the South to come North than it is to get to, for them to cherry pick and take the best in the North south yeah so no i mean i i I don't know i mean i i the the playoff thing concerns me for the game of college football in the long term yeah because yes this might seem like oh well over the span of you know this this sports relevance what's another four years like it doesn't matter it's just that you know they've dealt with no system for 40 years and then had the BCS for 10 years and you know, so on and so forth. But I, I just think that this gap between the haves and the have nots of the sport are, is just going to continue to widen. Like right. it, Ohio state is going it's... to remain the exception in the big 10, but outside, uh, like y- you've got six to maybe eight programs in college football that truly have any opportunity to even get to the playoff when it's a four team playoff. <laughs> like right. that's it's not sustainable. It's, so, it's relevant. I think that, sorry, T Frank, go ahead, go ahead. The, the four, the four years that they're kicking the can down the line are four very formative years <laughs> for the, for the future of college football based on yeah. what's happening. Right. Yeah. So I don't think, I think that's very relevant too, because you know, all of this change is happening and we don't, I guess we do know we're expecting the SEC programs to capitalize on the change best yeah. and delaying the college football playoff expansion, in my opinion, is only allowing them to to do that more. Yeah, so Th- there seems I, to be I, a, a lag. So instead of predicting the future, instead of being ahead of the curve... Uh, the institutions that voted against this are trying to delay and find clarity or whatever the reasons are for not expanding instead of taking advantage of name, image, and likeness, taking advantage of this new, more professionalized ecosystem in college sports. And that uh, it just it, that lag is going to create, as Nate said, a, the, a clear differentiation, even more so between the haves and the have-nots. Get to some fan questions here on the BWI Daily Edition. So if you have any questions you want to get in, you can throw them in now. We're going to be taking those and uh, answering a couple of them. A uh, quick reminder, uh, make sure you subscribe to the BWI Daily Edition on YouTube and you uh, like it wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up this week, Lamont Payne, quarterback for Penn State in class of 2023 commit. He's going to be joining the show. So make sure you stay tuned for that and you hit the notification button so you don't miss that interview with Lamont. Jonathan Perini asks, hey, what's the uh, what do you guys know about incoming walk-ons this year? Is there anything to know in this particular category, uh, Dave? And, and I'll ask you a follow-up to that. Somebody asked me this question. This might help um, give some insight. What's the difference between a preferred walk-on and a walk-on because those two terms are used uh, simultaneously. Are they the same thing or are they different? Yeah, I know very little about Penn State's walk-ons, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, I think we were planning on doing a little bit of a roundup uh, on all of the walk-ons on on, on uh, BlueWhiteIllustrated.com soon. So keep an eye out for that. I think Greg Pickle was going to do that. Um, for the follow-up, my interpretation of that, and again, Correct me if I'm wrong, because walk-ons are not my wheelhouse. But uh, my interpretation of that has always been like 
if you're a preferred walk on, like it's been arranged beforehand that you're going to walk on. Whereas if you're like a true walk on, it's kind of like you're at Penn State and you try out type of thing. Right. Maybe you, not. you're I recruited. Don't know. You're recruited without a scholarship. You're yes. you're preferred because they go out and they ask you to walk on instead of you make it as a walk on at Penn State. Uh, this one's a good one for you guys. Do you guys see growth in the Penn State basketball program with Shrewsbury versus the Chambers era? It has been a very short uh, Shrewsbury era. Uh, with two major cities, Philly, Pittsburgh, also close proximity to the uh, DMV corridor, Cleveland, etc. Do you guys see any differences or any growth in the program as opposed to recruiting Philly so heavily as Chambers did? Yeah, I mean, Dave Dave might be able to better handle this one. I think that clearly they have expanded their breadth a little bit to uh, the Midwest, right? I mean, because obviously Shrewsbury has some natural ties there in Indiana. So that includes Ohio, Michigan, you know, all, all of those Midwestern states. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do think that First of all, they, they've it's not like Chambers never recruited uh, the DMV, right? Like those those two areas, Philly and the DMV, are important for football, but they're really important for basketball too, and will remain very, very important for basketball. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly m- maybe it's not such a heavy emphasis to to to, to like limiting it just to uh, Philadelphia. But yeah, I mean, I I do think that those are still going to remain very, very important pieces of what Penn State does uh, in basketball recruiting moving forward. I just love we have a basketball question. I wanted to get to this to to get some idea. Not only that, once again, basketball recruiting, Dave, which I wanted to go to you last because you're our guy here. What's the the vibe you're getting from the recruiting um, uh, emphasis with Micah Shrewsbury? Yeah, so the way it was explained to me is that they have the kids that they're they're going to get are, are almost all the time they're going to fall under two umbrellas. One of which is they're going to be from a place where the Penn State name carries weight. So in-state, places like the DMV, um, they're actually they're offering a lot of kids from New England as well. Um, they haven't landed anybody up there yet, but uh, that's an area where I think they're they're. Uh, you know, looking to, to, to do, to do some damage. And then, you know, again, their second umbrella is where kids dream of playing in the big 10. And if you know anything about the basketball landscape in the Midwest, so Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, that type of, that type of place, um, that's the case. So they're, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna go after those kids because look, you know, uh, the Big Ten means something to those kids. If they don't get the offer from Indiana or or Purdue, um, you know they they might just go where they can play Big Ten basketball. And uh, I think you're seeing a, a, one of their primary targets in 2023 is a, is a guard from Indiana named Logan Imes. Um, and Logan does not have an Indiana or a Purdue offer, but. Uh, he's very talented and, you know, Penn state is, is trying to, to, to leverage the fact that they can give him big 10 basketball. So if, if they land him, I think that's, that's going to be one of those cases that falls under those umbrellas, so that umbrella. So they've got two different pieces of the puzzle. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit different. I don't know if it's super, super different, but, uh, we'll see where it takes them. It, it worked out in the first class that they put together for sure. We'll be getting to basketball coming up tonight against Maryland. One quick question uh, to round us out here, and then we're going to get to our daily competition between the three of your panelists here about who's going to be the most right about 2022. RS asks, what's the difference between Phil Troutwine's recruiting profile as opposed to previous O-line coaches? They're going for tall, lengthy fellas. What's the upside downside of this? I would just say that they're targeting and hitting on better prospects. When it comes down to it, Yes, there are things, and I asked uh, Phil Troutwine about this when he first got to Penn State, first opportunity we had to speak to him of 
what do you prioritize in an athlete? And he, he mentioned coachability because the offensive line position is so technical. And you have so much that you have to know how to do, and you can never stop working on your game, so you need to be coachable. But when it comes down to what I'm seeing from them, they're just getting physically mature players that are higher quality than they were previously. So that's the difference, is is they were going after guys with talent, with length and size, and they were just not hitting as much. So I don't know that it's a huge difference. It's just where the recruiting talent for Phil Troutwine lies as opposed to previous coaches. And then when it comes to what are they looking for when they don't get those things, I do think that there is a bit of a mixed bag. But the number one thing to me seems to be really good run blockers as one of the primary things. Have to be physical, have to have a certain amount of length to play at Penn State. So those are those are the two things. Because Drew Shelton is 275 pounds. He's six foot five. He's a left tackle prospect. He's in this class. Malik McNeil is 6'8", 340. So is Penn State going after guys that need to grow, or are they going after guys that they... I don't know that it's necessarily going into those sort of body type profiles. Uh, it's some of those other things we mentioned. But then when you look at the guys they're getting in class of 23 and beyond, they're, they're just talented. They're just good at football. So let's get into today's competition. Just a reminder how this works. Opening the chat right now for votes, and here is today's topic. Which Penn State starter will be the highest-ranked all-Big Ten performer? So, first team, second team, third team. Who do we think is going to land on that first team next year? That's what we're voting for. Everyone's going to give their guy. We're going to do this speed round a little bit today because we got to get to the game coming up tonight for Penn State basketball. So, we are going to go with Nate. You're going first. You have... Parker Washington, tell me why he's going to be an all Big Ten standout next season. Yeah, so full disclosure, I did not survey the rest of the league to see the talent that exists at receiver. Like, that may have been presumptuous of me <laughs> to select Parker Washington, given some of the talent that has existed uh, recently. When, when Jahan Dotson is a third-teamer, or an honorable mention in 2020 after blowing up the place. Um, that kind of tells you that it's a little bit of a crapshoot there at that position. However, I think he's really good. I think he's really good. I mean, he catches everything. Uh, he, he is the guy who is most dependable and reliable. I think that Sean Clifford has coming back. If Sean Clifford is the guy, um, you know, and so, yeah, I think, I think of, of all the players that, that Penn state has an opportunity to put first team, he's probably right there. Okay. So Dave, we're going to you, you have Tig Brown. Why do you think Penn state's veteran safety is going to be the guy who gets that top mark? I do have Tig Brown. Um, I have Tig Brown because I think he's very good, and I think that he plays at a position where there might be less likely to be other really flashy guys, uh, <laughs> um, you know, to, to take it from him. Um, he's a turnover machine, and we all know that the stupid media that votes for this doesn't watch the games and only looks at the stats. <laughs> so I a great point that, that – he's going to have lots of interceptions and that the media will vote for Tig Brown. He's awesome. Right. I mean, he's, he's, he's everything you want in a safety. He's impressive. Um, yeah. And I think some of the external factors will, will be in his favor too. Nate, do you have an all big 10 media vote? I do not for football. No, I okay. have one for basketball. Okay. I didn't know if you were part of the big bad media that uh, no, we but should I, all I, be railing against. As a, as a basketball voter, Dave's a hundred percent right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, like a secret. Everyone can see it. <laughs> it's, it's who are the guys that have the best stats and who are the guys that we knew about coming into the season? Who are the name guys? And the name guys is why I'm going with Joey Porter Jr. Mm, Joey selection. Porter Jr is the top returning corner at Penn State who had a good season, and I'm also predicting he's going to have a breakout next year. Uh, and to and I'm also going to rebuttal your guys' arguments here, and you can then follow up if you'd like to do that for mine, but Tig Brown had a great year when it came to interceptions in 2021. Are teams going to throw at him next year? 
We all know that interceptions can be largely fluky. Is he going to get a bunch of gimmies? I, I don't know that. I don't think at that position that doesn't impact the play nearly as much as some of the other ones, that is going to be a situation where that could be very hit or miss. So maybe, maybe Dave is right and he hits and he's an all-Big Ten first-team safety, or maybe he has a really good season and none of the stats show up. Parker Washington, Dave, uh, Nate, you made my argument for me. Who else are the other uh, receivers that are going to be getting a high volume of targets? Mitchell Tinsley comes into this team, and he's also a high volume receiver, explosive play guy, going to be on the boundary, might get more touchdowns, might get more touches. You might not even get the same number. Parker Washington could have a better season next year and not get the same accolades because of the guys around him. So to me, a guy that's a starter, has a name, is going to be on everyone's ballots preseason anyway, and then is going to play well. He's just, by name alone, if he gets a pick or a couple batted balls, I'm going with Joey Porter Jr. Uh, Dave, we'll go back in, descent, uh, back in reverse order. Your comments, anything else you want to say? I have, I have no rebuttal. I'm going to play nice. Okay, Nate? I mean, Dave already got two votes, so wow. I was going to say I that. Mean, it sounds like he won. I don't like it, but you know, we'll we see. Gotta live with it. I we're going to keep the voting open until about uh, twelve fifty-three, and then we're going to close the voting and see what happens. So, if you're watching this, if you're coming in a little bit later and you're watching this on delay, you still have time to vote, as long as you're not watching it on the replay or two hours later. So, we're going to move on to Penn State basketball. They play Maryland tonight. We talked about it at the beginning of the show. Opportunity to make it three in a row. Nate, you called this a must-win game. Give me a little more on why you think it's a must-win game. Yeah, I mean, like, let's not let's not lose our heads. Uh, I think that certainly everyone realizes and has adjusted expectations accordingly to the situation that Micah Shrewsbury inherited, right? Which wasn't bad, but it, it's not perfect. You got a uh, this big mix of of players, and so. I'm I'm derailing my own conversation from the start. Uh, the point is, is if they want to get to the postseason, if they want to be in the NIT and or, I mean, the NCAA is a, a very, very hey long now. shot right now. Easy, easy now. I'm just saying, <laughs> I, I, will, I will say this. The NCAA is not mathematically eliminated. Or yeah. eliminated right? right. Like it's not mathematically eliminated. It's extremely unlikely. It's not eliminated. The NIT. They get four out of five. We can talk about it, but if they, I mean, if they, if they, they basically need, they need five out of five and then they need yeah. to win like three games in the big 10. Like they need to get to the, <laughs> the, the like, so they need which, to go undefeated until they lose a game in the tournament. All I'll say is this is <laughs> given that they have been competitive against everyone that they've played, the big 10 tournament should make them feel very good. Yeah. Not bad. Like they should, they should be the team that thinks, oh, it just takes a run. Like it just, that's right. So, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. For any of that to matter, they need to win games now. And if, if we're talking about the most realistic possibility that's still out there for the postseason, that's the NIT. And to get to the NIT, they really need to go three and two down the stretch and they need to like, they need to crawl to over happen. a couple of other teams that are ahead of them right and that's that's part of this conversation as well dave um not not for the nit okay yeah for the their metrics bottom. yeah their their metrics right now which you know their net their ken palm rating like is very like nit bubble already okay um their problem is and this is not an explicit rule anymore but the NIT doesn't take teams that are below 500. So Penn State needs to be 500 or better. And if they get there, the numbers will take care of themselves and they'll get in, basically, is my interpretation of the situation. Um, there, there's also so many... I, I have a, a, a somewhat limited expertise on how the NIT works, given Penn State's proximity to uh, the world's favorite secondary postseason basketball tournament but there are so many auto bids 
yep. to the NIT that it's really like people think to themselves, like the perception is, oh, well, how, how can you not get into the NIT? Right. It's very easy to not get into the NIT. Like you can be passed over very easily because there just aren't that many kind of at large spots that go to power five teams like big, like Penn state would be in that situation. Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're a Penn state fan, like root against the fun things happening in the conference tournaments in March madness, because (laughs) the auto bids go to the regular season conference champions who do not win their tournament. So if you are a Penn state fan and you just really want to get into the NIT, (laughs) um, you basically root against fun in March. Root, root for you chalk. chalk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is this a team, and, and we got to get back to Maryland and, and some of the things to look at for tonight, but is this the team that can go on a run with their grinded out style? Are they going to have enough legs at the end of the season? Is the way that they play conducive to that or not conducive to that? Nate, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Dave. Yeah, I mean, I think that they play such a frustrating style of basketball for opponents like it's it's not fun and not supposed to be fun i thought that micah shrewsbury's comment after the game on thursday dave might be able to somewhat paraphrase it better than i can but like he he said something to the effect of hoping that fans were watching the game saw what was happening and turned it off (laughs) because it was so ugly (laughs) So uh, he's he's really going for those uh, going back to our conversation about TV and TV money. He really wants that TV money, doesn't he? He he is <laughs> he is leaning in on the path to wins for this team. Yeah, he he gets it. Like they they're not going to be able to to not play defense. Like if they're giving up seventy two points, they're going to lose. Mm-hmm. That's it. If they give up seventy two points, they lost. Um. So yeah. No, go ahead. So the, I guess away, that's Dave. that's my question is because defense is based on effort and energy and you can't have a flat game in the tournament. So if you're if you're trying to make that run, let's say you get through the, the final couple weeks here and you, you make that run to the Big Ten tournament, is there enough gas in the tank to play that way if you can't win a shoot it out game where you're, everyone's popping threes and stuff like that, Dave? Yeah, I would have some concerns about like the back end of the run if said run were to happen because if john hara has to play four games in a row on four days in a row like he might just just pass out like (laughs) because he (laughs) plays so hard but but yeah they don't have a ton of depth but so again if to me my i guess analysis of the potential for that is it's unlikely that they're going to win four big four games in the Big Ten tournament to begin with, um, with their lack of a ton of depth and what they demand of themselves on defense. I don't. I think it's it's made slightly less likely, but I do think at the front end of the Big Ten tournament, look, this is a team that's really comfortable playing these tight, um, you know, very intense games. They've been playing them all season. They're not going to panic if they don't score for four minutes, which tends to happen in postseason basketball because, again, you're living and dying with every possession. So to me, I think Penn State's style helps them on the front end and maybe hurts them on the back. Um, but for the back end to matter, you got to get there anyway. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, I think you'd rather have the help on the front end, especially if you just need one win to get into the DNIT. So, so if they were to make the turn, like if they were to make the tournament, let's go silly talk. When does the statue of John Hera go up? Is my question. <laughs> Immediately. Immediately. <laughs> they're going to start getting his dimensions for bronze at that point. I don't know that it's a statue. I think it's a, a little ID card that says, uh, free drinks at any establishment <laughs> in the borough of State College for the rest of your life. Oh, sure that's a good that, one. That's how that works. Uh, so I'm going to put you back up here, Dave, because you are our runaway winner today Boo. in our 2022 prediction. The only other person that got votes was Dave went rogue and, and voted for Olaf Ashanu. Uh, so <laughs> congratulations. Here's your victory acceptance speech. You have 20 seconds. I'm going to use about five of them. Thanks, guys. It really means a lot. 
<laughs> the the energy on this show today, the professionalism, the energy, we are bringing it. Uh, so coming up tonight, what do I need to watch for with Penn State basketball? What are the matchups that are going to determine this game? Uh, Dave, you wrote about it, so you're going to get more time to monopolize because you used three seconds wow. of your of your twenty. So we'll tack that on to your your uh, answer here. Yeah. So. Um, when I said Maryland was a disaster before, I think <laughs> I just meant the basketball program is in a state of disaster <laughs> uh, because they don't have a coach, which tends to be important. Um, their interim head coach is Danny Manning, who was, you know, did not do a very good job when he had a job, uh, a full time job. Um, and, and, and Mark Turgeon was fired at the beginning of the year. So, you know, um, they have a couple good guards, Eric Ayala. Um, who's been around forever. Very good. He's averaging like 14 points a game. And then they have Fats Russell, who has an elite <laughs> basketball name. Um, graduate transfer from Rhode Island, I believe. Is he also great at dice? Uh, I feel like with a name I, like Fats Russell, so. he's great at dice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he's also a good scorer, also ar around that 14 points per game mark. Um, so you'd expect to see Seth Lundy on probably Ayala. Ayala is a little bit bigger and, 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 you know, Penn state usually uses Lundy to shut down the, the best wing, um, the opposition has. So, and then the other thing that you, you've got to kind of got to be aware of is that Maryland loves to get to the foul line. Maryland shoots like 20 free throws a game. So if Penn state can avoid fouling, um, which generally, you know, the, the, the whistle isn't always kind to them, but I do think they do a good job of being disciplined on defense um, and avoiding that. Then I think they're they're in good shape. So we'll see. Both offenses, not very efficient. Um, Maryland tends to play a little bit of a higher pace, so we'll see if maybe we get into, like, the high 60s here. But I would expect a, a not very awesome offensive game. Um, but I think that suits Penn State, so we'll see. Uh, we are getting into the almost 60s here on the weather today, Nate. Uh, what are you looking at tonight in the game? Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, look, uh, I, I have, this might be the lazy way out, but every game that Penn State plays is decided in the last, I don't know, 60 seconds right now, like for the last four weeks, three weeks. So I don't see that changing. Um, obviously, the Minnesota game on Thursday was not, was a, like a more authoritative win. But it, it, to me, like Penn State, it, it's it's kind of striking. Um, Penn State's one and what, Dave? Seven on the road yep. right now? Uh, one yep. and seven Maryland's on the road. One and three at home. So yeah. <laughs> in, in, in conference play. So yeah. So like, it's, it's just like somebody has to win the game. Um, it's like and... a pool noodle fight. <laughs> I, no, I mean, look, like I, I do think that there is an argument to be made that it, it, and like, it, I, I know that it sounds demeaning, but you, these are like, these are highly competitive games. Like the, the teams on the bottom half side of the conference uh, outside of really what Nebraska, all of them can win games and have yeah, won games. Definitely. And so if like there, there is pride to be had to, to win, like to, to, to scratch and claw your way to the middle of the conference standings by the end of the season, like Penn state uh, again, pie in the sky, but like Penn state doesn't have to play in the first day of the big 10 tournament. If it wins some games, yeah. like if it, if it goes, uh, three and two, it, it can, it can start in the second round of the big 10 tournament and get that first round by. So, um, you know, it, it, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I think Ken Palm has them Penn state losing by two. Um, but yeah, we'll see. It's a coin flip. Dave, any last thoughts we get out here on the show today? No. Um, okay, great. Nate, any last thoughts <laughs> as we get out of here on the show today? I'm looking forward to the game tonight. I think it's going to be entertaining. I'm, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like I, I've always liked watching Penn state basketball and just Penn, like college basketball. Uh, and I, I think that there's <laughs> of, of all the things to talk about Parker Washington, potentially being uh, all big 10 next year, or like a team that 
is actually playing a game that we get to watch and have opinions about, I'm taking the basketball. Come on, join me. <laughs> Parker Washington I, is was pretty good at four square, if we want to talk about that. But <laughs> he's low to the ground. He can get that ball he down is. really quickly and get a lot of force on it. Uh, Nate, I love your enthusiasm. Appreciate that. And if you want more of that enthusiasm, you want to get access, you want to mainline that sort of feeling, bluewhiteillustrated.com on the message board tonight is where you find these two guys, Nate Bauer, Dave Eckert, giving their thoughts live in game on the thread for the, the the game tonight between Maryland and Penn State. You only get there if you are a member of Blue White Illustrated. Join for just $1. Link is in the description of this video. And, of course, like us on YouTube. We're putting in the work. We're grinding. We're getting all your off-season content, keeping you with that sweet, sweet content until football is back. And as we come down the home stretch in basketball. I'm gonna have to flip those, Nate. You're, you're convincing me that I gotta lead with basketball's coming down the home stretch. This is exciting stuff. Get into Penn State basketball. That's coming up tonight. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We'll talk to you later.